looking at some videos recently by various author friends, it's been interesting to understand how we all have the same issue of dealing with how we feel when we're not writing, but also looking at the ways that we can get back into regular writing. Some call it procrastination, others call it worry of not being good enough. For myself, I know that I had a really good and productive writing period in February and March. And by the end of March, I put 70,000 or almost 72,000 words into a new storyline and a new book about uh, crime fiction in Nottinghamshire, my home county. I went travelling and that was great to spend time with friends and family. And I enjoyed trips to Oxford and Birmingham and London and different places away from Yorkshire. But what I seemed not to be able to do was get back into a regular writing habit. I hadn't expected that. I thought that my first week of travelling time would actually have been really productive and would have added maybe an extra 10,000 words and seen me wrapping up the story and getting it all to come together. It didn't happen. I think I managed about three or 4,000 words over the course of a month. And I think I wanted to beat myself up a little bit. I'm like, That's what I noticed when I was looking at a video by a friend, Tish, Tish Bouvier, who's here on YouTube. Um, and she's writing Cozy Mystery at the moment. And she was sharing in a video that really I found very helpful. She was sharing about the fact that she was writing last year quite regularly up until December. And then sort of, I don't know whether she hit a brick wall or she needed to focus on family time and, and those sorts of things. Uh, but she explained how she felt disappointed in herself and wanting to get back to regular writing. And I know exactly how that feels. I think it's all well and good to create targets and set goals for 2,000 words a day or 500 words a day or consistency. And I know that for myself that helps enormously because it spurs me into action more often than not. But there are times, like I, I've experienced this past month, where actually I've just enjoyed life. I've done things that I wanted to do. I've spent time with my sons. I've enjoyed a trip down to London. I met up with a friend there, Alan, who's helping me with some of my book creation work. And, and that was very good. And a change of scenery often is really helpful. In fact, there was one particular time when I was in a coffee shop in Oxford. I was in Waterstones with my son. And we were working together on two separate projects, but sitting at a table together and just enjoying that time in the, in the coffee shop. And two ladies took the seats just next to us, literally, no more than a metre away. And they were talking about some things that were strikingly personal. One lady had recently lost her husband and the other lady who was married and had no experience of that loss was asking her some really direct questions that I was surprised about. But also there was that joy of being in a public space and just listening to people talking about their lives and talking about what they go through. And the lady who was the widow was talking about her change in sleep patterns, her lack of interest in food, in preparing food for herself now being more of a chore when she'd been doing that with her partner and for her husband. And Johnny and I were just sitting there working away on our laptops, on projects, and I felt so immensely privileged to be part of human society and human life where I could listen in on this deeply personal, tragic conversation about how a lady was recovering from the loss of her husband. And it was recent. It had happened, I think, within the, re the most, within the past year. Just being privileged enough to listen to that and afterwards I thought to myself, well, I don't know whether I'll ever use any of that. It seems so private and so personal. But listening to her talk about the loss of her partner, of her husband, touched me enormously. 
And it might be the case that somewhere in the future, in a piece of writing, I will use two or three sentences that came from that conversation in order to describe the pain and the sorrow that that woman is feeling, but also how she has moved from the sudden loss of her husband to the place of being a single mature woman again and looking at what happens and how things take place in her life that it was an astounding conversation um but we as authors as writers we overhear things i work in coffee shops a lot of the time in fact my preferred writing these days is in coffee shops when i was writing um previously very much only non-fiction i needed to be in my studio or my writing space and that was how i would be productive my first book was written in a three-week period where I went five days a week to be on my own in a cottage away from my wife and family. And within the 21 days, that book was finished and sent to a traditional mainstream publisher who took it on board. They had, in fact, commissioned it. And that book um, did me very well for several years. But nowadays, I like to write in coffee shops. I always find that the chatter and the buzz of other people talking, of coffees being made, of crockery being washed up. I always find that like white noise. So when this particular conversation was happening near to us a few weeks ago, it was it was very unusual because I don't normally listen in on conversations. I just zone them all out. And all I hear is my keyboard and my thoughts as I'm working to the manuscripts in front of me. So it was a trigger moment for me and one that I was really grateful to experience and privileged to experience. And it might be something like that that takes you or I away from not being able to write or not being motivated to put pen to paper or to pick up that laptop and open the screen and, and, and get to work with it. But I think we have to, as writers, look for what it is that gives us trigger points and allows us to pick up on on new things um, and I found that I have written several hundred words just about listening in on that conversation not to pick over it but just to think it was fascinating to, to listen to, to listen in on that um, but I've been back home now for a few days and I have started writing again I haven't been out to a coffee shop I've done some writing early in the morning sort of five o'clock and six o'clock in the morning before the rest of the household is up and active and busy. Um, but tomorrow I'm out, tomorrow's a Saturday and I'll be out at a coffee shop again. But I know what I'm going to write. I'm, I'm picking up on the crime fiction story and I feel really good about that. Part of my, part of the trip I had recently, I spent a few days down in Nottinghamshire and I went to Southall Minster, which is the cathedral church of Nottingham. And I spent time there because that's the setting for some of the crimes in this current book and it was great just to be around the community that I like that I spent a lot of time in as a child my grandfather and then my uncle had a business which in fact is the building is still there albeit their business um, trades in a different way these days but it's nice to be in that community and to have a wander around and I was able to talk to staff from the Minster Church, from the Minster, and they were fascinated by what I was looking to do within the story and how I was using the building as a venue for some of the actions that take place. So that was part of my trip and part of my research, and in a way I made thousands of words of notes, and that I could count as writing, but I, I tend not to. For me, the word count is, is what the reader will actually end up seeing. So I, start, I started this little afternoon video talking about procrastination and delay. I hadn't expected to talk about the conversation that I was privileged to listen to in the coffee shop, but, but it helped me. It allowed me to sit down with my journal later that day and just put down a few paragraphs of notes. But the, the visual image of, of what happened and what I saw and what I listened to um, was phenomenal and I think sometimes we will 
be exposed to interesting things, fascinating conversations, things that we see as we're driving past or, or walking within a, a community. And some of those will go in your journal or your moleskin or whatever it is you use. And at some point in the future, they will be a very useful resource that you weren't expecting to have. One thing that might help you is if you're not already journaling on a regular basis, just make some bullet points every night before you sleep about what's happened in your day. And it may well be the case that somewhere in there are some nuggets and some jewels for you to be able to access to help you with your writing process uh, soon, soon in the future. Anyway, I hope this has been helpful. It's a glorious day outside here. I can see hummingbirds in the garden. So I'm looking forward to just grabbing a coffee and going to sit outside the window of my office here. And I wish you every success this afternoon with your writing. And if you've got any comments, if you want to share how you have overcome procrastination or when you have been frozen in your ability to write or your sense that you can write, what did you do? Because I'm sure that I and lots of others looking at this will be really grateful to you for what you can share about procrastination. And a quick shout out to Tish. Tish, thank you for your video last week. It really helped me and I found it incredibly inspiring. And I loved how honest you were about the struggle you've gone through in finding time to put words onto the screen. But I know that you've started again and in your own words, you're pushing language forward. So thank you very much for all of that.